Well, thanks. I'm so excited about this talk because I had an opportunity to go to all day soil seminars with PhD soil scientists and talk to ranchers and farmers that are doing regenerative agriculture, um, where a lot of the really important information about healthy soils is going on. So I'm going to bring it to you guys. So I'm going to share my screen. And start with uh, going beyond healthy soil, actually talk about perfect soil, because why not? So we have the garden that we look at, that we pick flowers from or fruit from or pull weeds from the top side of the garden. But we're going to talk today about the upside down garden, everything below the level of the soil. So um, people in the industry talk about soil, not dirt. Dirt is what you vacuum out of your house. Soil is what plants grow in. And it has a lot of jobs. It has to hold plants in place. This giant oak in the corner of my yard didn't blow over, thank goodness, with those 80 mile per hour winds. And that's a big sail surface there. Um, it's got to hold water in place for the plants to slurp that up. It actually has to hold air in place also because root cells breathe. They need air. They metabolize just like our cells breathe. And it has to be home to not only the plant roots, but thousands and millions of organisms that fetch water and nutrients for the plant growth. So soil is a huge hum of activity that we can dig into. So back to like the very basics. Um, we have the food makers, which are plants, and everyone else is a food eater. So an autotroph, something that makes its own food by photosynthesis, or a heterotroph, something that's gonna eat a plant or eat an animal that has eaten a plant, because we do not eat sunlight. Plants somehow invented photosynthesis a long, long time ago, where they can simply take water and carbon dioxide powered by sunlight to produce sugar as the initial building block, and then every other molecule that is found in a plant. I mean, if you close your eyes and are given a peach or an apricot, you can instantly tell the difference, especially if they're homegrown and flavorful, because there's all these flavor molecules in there, and there's vitamins in there, and proteins and fats and carbohydrates that are the things that we eat. So plants make all the food for people, animals, fungi, bacteria, and other microorganisms. Plants also make fiber, like cotton, for clothing, wood, for shelter, like all our houses. And really importantly, and more importantly, every single day, is they regulate the weather pattern on the planet. So thank you, plants. So the spoiler alert is that you can't buy perfect soil. You can start it out. Um, they're the to kickstart it, but it's not perfect soil until there are living plant roots and organisms working together to make stable soil aggregates, basically spitballs of minerals, organisms, air, and water glued together with glue, and the organisms that go fetch water and minerals for the plants. So perfect soil is a living zoo, if you will. It's got the roots and the organisms working together. But the um, EB stone fertilizers actually contain mycorrhizae, one ingredient of perfect soil. And we're going to hear about a lot more. So people are probably familiar with the gut microbiome, the bacteria in our intestines that helps us fend off from disease, gives us vitamin K and other nutrients, and metabolizes some of the food products. Well, the plants don't have a gut, so they have an external gut, and we're going to call that the rhizosphere, the atmosphere right around the roots. And there are just as many organisms in that area, like our gut microbiome, that help the plant, just like our gut microbiome helps us. So rhizosphere may be a new term, um, but the gut bugs help us and the root zone bugs help the plants. It's like the external gut. 
in an acre of soil, if it's level, it's 208 by 208 feet, in an acre of soil, if you really examine all the uh, plant, all the organisms there, you're gonna find bacteria and fungi. So they're gonna be microscopic um, insects or other arthropods, protozoa, like the amoebas that you might've seen under a microscope if you look at pond water, nematodes, which are very small worms, and um, then to bigger and bigger organisms, my least favorite being um, pocket gophers, but they're there too. And that can add up to 6,000 pounds worth of organisms. So that is the size of one female African elephant without the baby. The bull elephants evidently are 13,000 pounds. So you have an elephant in your yard. Well, elephants eat a lot, a lot of grass. And so what are all these organisms eating? It turns out they are eating plant exudate. And these are these beautiful little drops that are exuded, purposefully leaked out of the root hairs to feed the surrounding organisms. And plants do photosynthesis and they use that to make fruit, to grow, but they also send that sugar down to the roots that are leaked into the soil to feed the organisms. And they feed the organism sugar, just like food, but also leak out chemicals to ask specific organisms to go get more nitrogen, to go get more potassium, to go get all the elements that you see on a bag of fertilizer. So it isn't an accident that these roots are leaking this photosynthate, the stuff they make by photosynthesis, and a huge percentage of it at that, but controlled and um, customized to what the goal the plant wants. And it's gonna feed the soil food web. So I got this picture from Inco Cells um, collecting soil exudate for the cosmetic industry. So. That was just the prettiest picture I could find of a, a root exudate. So it's not from my garden. So in the old days, like when I was in school, we talked about food chains. You have protozoa um, and little fish eating, getting eaten by bigger fish, getting eaten by bigger fish, getting eaten by the great white shark in a linear line, a food chain. But when you have a food web, you can cross over. A fungi can eat a nematode, a nematode can eat a fungi, everybody can eat bacteria, um, and other organisms, birds can eat the insects, etc. So rather than an acre of soil, because not very many of us have an acre, hopefully you have more than a teaspoon of soil, but even in a teaspoon of soil, there's billions of bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, and fungi. A single chain of fungi, one cell thick is a hyphae, when they're all together like a fiber optic um, channel, then they're um, mycelia. So you can see the mycelia, you can't see the hyphae without a microscope. So, when you talk about perfect soil, you can break it down to ingredients. And the simplest way to think about it is start with ground up rocks, 45%. There's water and there's air, and there's only 5% of organic material. Could be as high as 10%, could be as low as half a percent, but on average 5% in decent soil. Live organisms, live roots, um, dead plant material, dead organisms, and the decomposed um, matter that uh, organisms break out uh, from dead plant material, would be, which would be humus. The ground up rocks have names because everything has a name. And uh, a lot of the older soil books start with classifying soil as clay or silt or sand or loam. So the tiniest particles are clay and they actually turn out to be fairly flat and, and sit together very adherently. So you can make an adobe house with clay soil, just drying it in the sun, or you can actually fire it in a kill and make all the dishes in your house. So that would be clay, the tiniest soil particles. A little bit bigger would be silt. The biggest would be sand that you can actually see a soil a rock particle with your eyes and then when you have combinations you simply call it 
loam. So that would be your soil uh, mineral content. And in those tiny particles of rock are the minerals that the plant needs, but they're hard to get. So plants um, do have a grocery list. Uh, sunlight, the plants are not gonna grow, uh, they're not gonna do photosynthesis in the dark. And uh, so they need sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, but they also need a handful of other elements. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the most needed. So that's the big letters on your bag of fertilizer, NPK. And then these other elements are also necessary for growth. And you look at the periodic table. Some of you may not be looking at the periodic table, but I find it unbelievably fascinating that all the plants are using basically all these light elements, none of these heavy metals that are poisoning Flint, Michigan, et cetera, et cetera, but all relatively bunched up at the top of the periodic table. And I just want to talk to some paleo botanist and find out if they were the most plentiful elements when photosynthesis was, was getting evolved or whatnot. But I just find it amazing that they're grouped up at the top. But you don't need to be a chemist and put all these elements yourself into your soil. You can actually support the soil food web itself and nature will take care of a lot of it. And one way to sit back and enjoy a story is to watch the movie from 2018, The Biggest Little Farm, which is really wonderful. So that's the movement that's going beyond um, organic agriculture, which is a was a huge advance to regenerative ag agriculture, to actually bring soil back to a pristine state and, and healthier after 7,000 years of intensive agriculture. So basically copying nature, not tilling, not adding synthetic chemical fertilizers, not resorting to sides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, um, and to use lots and lots of different cover crops and lots of different plants in your garden. Lots of diversity above ground makes for lots of diversity below ground. So you're gonna be supporting the microorganisms in the soil and those microorganisms in the soil are gonna be supporting the plants. So it's a symbiotic relationship absolutely, absolutely tied into each other to help each other. So mycorrhizae fungi are one of the organisms that are incredibly helpful to plants, to 90% of plants. Not every plant needs a mycorrhizal fungi along, tagging along with it. Myco is Latin for fungus and rhizae is Latin for root. So these are fungi that extend out from the root. And uh, Professor A.B. Frank was sent by his regional king out to the forest to improve the truffle harvest. Truffles are underground mushrooms that people adore. And he was digging around oaks and beaches and found all these fungi attached to the roots. And these trees look really healthy. So he actually published a paper. He goes, you know, I see these fungi and they may actually be helping the plant, just as a guess, because he didn't have the tools at that time to test it. But he said, well, maybe they're helping the plant get uh, water, get nutrients, whatever, and published it. But no one believed him. Fungi were considered bad, disease, and there are fungi that are diseases like powdery mildew and bunch rot. A lot of the interesting agriculture in those days was in the wine industry and they had a not a love-hate relationship with fungi they had a hate-hate relationship with fungi they didn't ever have the concept that fungi could be helpful it's funny that this drawing would be of a regular mushroom dropping its spores and the mycorrhizae underneath whereas truffles are underground mushrooms and the reason they smell so good is they have to emit a smell strong enough that a pig or a dog can dig them up and sell them at market for thousands of dollars so um, no one believed them for a long 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 time until 1955. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture wanted to grow pine trees in Puerto Rico. 
well, Puerto Rico has 500 native trees, but they wanted to add 501st and add pine trees. And they didn't knock down, thankfully, pristine virgin native forests. They used leftover agricultural land, but they would grow these pines uh, intending to use them for paper pulp. And they would grow a few inches and die, grow a few inches and die. And they tried the mountains, they tried the coast, they tried the dry areas, they tried the wet areas, they tried the clay areas, they tried the sand areas. They did a survey of the entire island of Puerto Rico to see where these pine trees would be happy and failed and failed and failed. Finally, someone brought some soil from North Carolina where these particular pine trees were native and added the soil to 32 experimental plants. And then they cultivated the soil around 32 control plants. And then they didn't cultivate the soil, but left another 32 plants completely alone. So the 32 plants that got the soil from North Carolina at one year were five feet tall. And the other plants basically didn't grow at all or died. Now I have never planted a tree that grew to five feet tall in one year. So this is just extraordinary. So what's so special about the mycorrhizae fungi? Well, one of the jobs it does is to make glomalin. Now I talked about stable soil aggregates. These are basically the spitballs of bits of rock, organic material, air and water glued together. So glomalin is the glue and it's insoluble in water. So when it rains, these soil aggregates stay put. And so discovered by some women botanists, um, also from the US Department of Agriculture. And glomalin is a, it's the, art, it's the molecule that makes our soil work, makes for perfect soil. So in, when the mycorrhizae fungi is alive, it coats the, um, the hair to protect it, just like your you know, wires to recharge your phone have a plastic coating around them. When those mycorrhizae die, the glomalin is sloughed off and is, provides the material for the glue for the stable soil aggregates. And these stable soil aggregates are irregular in shape. So when they pile on top of each other, there's room for the roots to grow. There's room for pockets of air and pockets of water. So it makes a great structure, soil structure. And when you double dig your soil with a shovel, which gets tiresome after about the first three feet, you're not making little 0.5 millimeter stable soil aggregates. You're making big clumps. So these aggregates are way better than anything you're gonna do with uh, physical digging or tilling. Not all soils have fungi. And so another um, origin of the glue is slime from bacteria. And we are dealing with slime from bacteria every morning when you feel your teeth in the morning that are covered with slime until you brush your teeth. So there's lots of bacteria that make slime also. So there's lots of glues in the soil to make these stable soil aggregates. When I was a little kid, I was fascinated by glue. It was really weird, but that's okay. One of the best um, visuals to feel the difference between perfect soil and not perfect soil is um, what a lot of um, demonstrations are. They pay, take a pile of flour, cake flour, um, all-purpose flour, versus a piece of bread and make it rain by poking holes in the bottom of a Dixie cut. So when it rains on flour, so you can imagine soil that you've dug and dug and dug and made into flour, you have erosions and channels, you have puddling where the plants are suffocating, and you have dry areas where even though it's just rained, the soil is still dry. So this would be very difficult soil for plants to live in. Whereas if you convert flour to bread and you rain on it, there's no puddling. There's pretty even distribution of water. There's retention of water for as long as the bread stays moist, weeks. And there's great water infiltration. It doesn't just run off the surface. There's no erosion. So the image of perfect soil, the water infiltrates, gets down into the soil. It stays there, doesn't have erosion, and doesn't blow off like uh, the dust bowl. 
and has air pockets for roots. And um, these organisms has air po uh, pockets for the organisms to fetch the plant water and, and uh, minerals. So I'm not suggesting you convert your garden to sourdough bread that you baked all during COVID, but it's the example of thinking about uh, raw soil or raw minerals versus perfect soil. It's a visual. So how do you get stable soil aggregates? Well, a lot of people are talking about it. There's a British gardener named Charles Dowding, and he has books and courses online, and he is a vegetable gardener and um, is completely converted to no-till, no-dig, no fallow period. So this area might have been cleared out yesterday, and he's going to be replanting it with all his little seedlings today. Um, when you have a field that is laid to rest, fallow, with no live plants on it, the soil organisms have nothing feeding it, and it's a detriment to the soil. It is not helpful to the soil. And he doesn't use synthetic fer fertilizers either. He makes a lot of compost and has lots and lots of different plants close together. Some people actually mix their vegetables in one plot. He keeps them separate, but um, a lot of people are mixing their vegetables together, like mixing a flower garden together. So I've created a Bumble dating profiles for annuals versus perennials. So some annuals, um, only work with bacteria and they don't make a long-term relationship with uh, the mycorrhizal fungi. So their post would be something like looking for a short-term, no strings attached relationship. I'm an annual who must germinate, grow, flower, get pollinated, which of course means sex. That's the sexual reproduction of plants, make seeds and split. That's it. Quick and dirty and out of here. So they would be attached to more bacteria in the soil. Whereas a redwood tree, 2000 years old, I'm only middle-aged. I'm looking for a long-term relationship that's mutually beneficial. I'm a superb provider of sugars, soil exudates, um, root exudates and other nutrients. All I ask for in return is for you to fetch me water and leach out minerals from tiny rock fragments. That's it. And we can live happily for another 2000 years. So I'm asking people to consider not adding synthetic fertilizer. And that's because as soon as you feed a plant that quick and dirty miracle grow, um, you, you stop the plant from um, exuding the uh, root exudates and you need to continue that practice forever. So the um, lupins were found on very rough soil, rocky soil, um, not nutrient, not nutritious soil. And it was thought that the lupins were stealing the nutrition from the soil, but actually they could live there because they and many other plants can um, have root nodules that have bacteria in them that can get nitrogen from the air that, uh, that is plant available, nitrogen fixer. So they're actually adding to the, um, to the nutrition to the soil. And just like lupins would named after wolves, it was thought that wolves just um, were predators and not helpful to the whole ecosystem. But now, of course, we know that wolves are helpful to the ecosystem, and um, just like in uh, Yellowstone. So organic fertilizers are going to be much better and um, going to support the soil food web and support the relationship between plants and the organisms. So why do plants need nitrogen? Um, I talked about sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide making sugar, but many other molecules that it builds from the sugar, like the proteins and the fats, think of an avocado, has fats, or think of a bean, 25% protein. If you look at the chemical composition of those molecules, they contain nitrogen. The DNA contains nitrogen. The RNA contains nitrogen. Um, so when we eat a vegan meal, we're eating plant protein. If we're eating an animal, we're eating um, the protein that actually came from a plant. So we need plants need a lot of nitrogen, even though the air is a lot of nitrogen. And two is three covalent blends. It's two um, 
tightly adhere it for a plant to break apart. So you can add the quick and dirty fertilizer, but that has runoff and has caused problems with eutrophication, where a pond will have algal scum over it, um, crowd out the sunlight for the plants below. And when it dies, um, the bacterial decomposers actually consume all the oxygen and the fish die too. So it's a quick runoff. So your plants get very little of what you're applying and the downstream literally effects are gonna be detrimental. So this is actually more detail about the nitrogen cycle, which can even make me cross-eyed, but um, it does talk about a continuum of soils that would be bacterial rich, like the annuals, like in the bubble profile, uh, and fungal rich um, on the more established plants um, that are succession planting. And the different nitrogen compounds that the organisms turn in uh, nitrogen into that are available to plants. So there's a nitrogen cycle as well. Um, I guess a little bit of nitrogen can be gleaned from, uh, from lightning, but most of it is gonna be from um, cycling of the nutrients. And if you don't have a cow in your backyard, you can have an earthworm in your backyard. And those castings are actually earthworm manure. Um, but you have um, a very complicated nitrogen cycle um, that's gonna go on only if you have lots and lots of different soil organisms. So people are always like, huh, wait a minute. Didn't tillage work? And it did for 7,000 years. Um, the birth of agriculture meant that not everyone had to be a um, hunter-gatherer or a pastoralist. And um, a subset of people could be dealing with farming and other people could do politics. Oh no, just kidding. Um, music, art, literature, et cetera, et cetera. But we have hit a wall. Uh, we most dramatically hit a wall um, in the era of the Dust Bowl, but we are very much hitting the wall in other areas too. And the soil organic content, which could have been originally 10%, is now like 0.5%. So in order to grow plants now in depleted soil, it asks for a lot of nutrients. Whereas if we make the soil better, we're not going to have to be adding all those nutrients. We're going to build back the soil and have plants grow better without added um, nutrients that are actually coming from the fossil fuel industry. So then you're like, well, I just wanna till it once. I just wanna loosen the soil one time. And that's why there's so many words for tilling. There's plowing, disking, harrowing, cultivating, digging, double dibbing, triple digging. Um, and it's gonna break up the high fill um, chains, because they're long, it's also going to add oxygen as a blast to all the organisms, which are going to over consume um, the, um, the organic material in the soil, rather than leaching it through drip by drip by drip. And these soil aggregates are very small. I mean, you can't really, you can feel them if you take a handful of soil and squish it and look at it, it has tilth, but um, they're, they're they're pretty small. So even one pass will be disruptive. So everything is sort of flipped to top dressing, top dress with compost, and then you can cover the compost with mulch and have a diversity of plants and have the plants make the healthy soil for themselves. So you might think, hmm, well, I don't have an acre of soil. I don't have an elephant in my garden and my garden is tiny. Well, not that many gardens are tinier than this terrarium. Um, so it has been sealed for 50 years. It actually was watered once in 1972, but it has a perfect cycling of sunlight coming in, but reusing everything else over and over and over again, um, actually, 100% recycling of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, all those elements from the periodic table, all that's needed is sunshine. So yes, you can have um, so healthy soil in a small garden. 
So your action items would be to leave the leaves. Plants excavate everything helpful out of the leaf before it drops, and it just has a shell of its former self, and it's going to provide mulch. Um, and you can stay on your path so you're not squishing everything, but leave the leaves in your garden. You can top dress with compost and mulch. You can use your weeds also. When you top dress with mulch, you want to keep it away from the base of a trunk of a tree. Roots can accommodate to being periodically wet, um, but the above ground parts of the plant really don't like it. And so you want to leave that bare and have the plant on just a slight mound. The synthetic fertilizers are going to be detrimental to the development of perfect soil. Um, you want to consider insects in your garden to be delicious uh, bird food and insects you can consider to be pollinators. Um, you want the plants to be site appropriate, a shady plant in the shady area, a sunny plant in the sunny area, because a healthy plant is going to make healthier soil faster. And native plants, and I'm going to talk about in April, are going to be the most supportive to the native soil organisms. In a completely new area, sheet mulching is a great way to start. You use cardboard to eliminate light so the weeds can't grow, no light, no plants, and then add the compost and mulch. And you can cut X's in and put in your plants immediately, but you're going to be starting that uh, development of purple so perfect soil as a Kickstarter. Um, in areas that in the fall, um, I cover my areas between my perennial crops as um, multi-species cover crops. There's seed mixes available that have fava beans and bell, uh, bell beans and clovers and vetches and even grasses. Um, so you get this beautiful cover crop. Um, right plant, right place to research which plants are most appropriate for your garden. You can um, cruise calscape.org and have lots of diversity in your planting and keep reading. Speaking about reading, Grow Your Soil was a really good introductory book to harness the power of the soil food web to create your best garden ever by Diane Messler. Uh, Dirt to Soil was this book. Gabe Brown talks about transitioning to regenerative agriculture and making farming fun, fun again. Jeff Lowenfelds is a gardener in Alaska. So he gets to garden, I don't know, two months of the year. And then he writes books the other 10 months of the year. But he's written a series of teeming books, teeming with microbes, teeming with fungi, et cetera, et cetera, teeming with nutrients, which are a lot of fun. Um, to really get a feel for the devastation of the Dust Bowl. Um, someone might want to read John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. It was impressive and impactful. And um, I always like the works of Doug Tallamy, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. And I have included um, some cowscape. Uh, there was an unbelievably cute article or wonderful article by uh, George Montbiant in The Guardian about um, the environment uh, below the surface of the soil. And this link had the, uh, the story of the discovery of the mycorrhizal fungi, which seems so recent. I mean, 1955 is when they actually put it to the test and added the soil. So... Um, that's what I have. I'm going to stop sharing and see if there's any questions or I can leave the um, the references up for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, um, and also you can always go back uh, to some, some earlier slides if you want to use it for uh, help with the questions. But okay. that was wonderful. Thank you, Joan. Uh, that was um, it was really insightful. I really like hearing a lot about how the plants are interacting with the soil and especially the mycorrhizae and the funguses because it's a really cool topic that we talk about pretty often, but um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to get the full concept uh, through. So thank you for having this nice resource for, for that information. Um, and we have a couple of questions and I have a couple too that uh, can help at least go a little bit more on based on what you talked about. Um, and especially because you brought up a lot of concepts that are less, um, yes, less utilized or maybe um, not as talked about because of the idea of tilling and actually moving soil around and how that could be a detriment compared to what we usually recommend about amending and stuff. So um, one question I wanted to kind of start with is 
Um, you're mentioning earlier on when you have a, a planted area that has uh, plants growing in it already um, that is able for the soil to be moved around and utilized. Uh, but then sometimes when they're not being utilized or it's called, I think you mentioned it was called fallow, um, <laughs> is when the soil is a lot more, um, I don't know if I want to say dead, but it, it definitely is in a less perfect state. Um, is at that point um, is only like, you're mentioning only just sheet mulching on top of it. If we want to suggest to amend the soil, how is a good way to amend the soil with the different kinds of stuff without damaging it too much? But also um, I feel like maybe laying it on top doesn't seem as helpful to me, but I would like to know. Oh yeah, that's think. interesting. So fallow was a agricultural practice. Well, it still is. I mean, I'm living in Sonoma and I look around. And so when a crop is done, when a crop is harvested, they go through with a plow or a harrow or whatever instrument they do and kill, every, dig everything up, just like blast it. And it's just a dirt field. There's not one growing thing in it. And the concept was that you're letting the soil quote unquote rest. And it always bugged me when I was a little kid learning about American history, how farmers would um, have a crop for a while, the the fields would get tired and they would have to expand. This is the impetus for the Western expansion and you know all the other aftermath of that and have to, to put their crops on a new plot of soil. I'm like, wait a minute, I grew in California. There's 4,000 year old bristlecone pines. There's 4,000 year old redwoods. That soil isn't tired. Those trees are just fine. Why do these farmers growing tobacco in Kentucky have to knock off a few more, you know, indigenous population and move their field? It's because fallow is bad, bad, bad. Because you don't have a living plant dripping out root exudates to support the soil organisms. And so they'd be they would be starting with with um, soil that's less helpful, less friendly to plants, mm -hmm. and it would get tired. So basically, um, if you have a garden, if you have a weed patch, um, that's what you're talking about. So a weed, you know, you can remove all the weeds, and that is disturbing the top inch of soil. I mean, you, you want to get at least the crown out. You can leave the roots in, but you want to get the crown out, and you can replant it. Um, if you want to do sheet mulching, that's when you put the cardboard over your, say, lawn, and the plants that are under the cardboard won't get any light and they'll die. And then on top of that, you can put your compost in your mulch and keep it moist and then start replacing it with plants. Um, so it's not the same as fallow would be the um, the destruction of all living plants in a field um, to um to kill all the weeds for the next crop. Yeah. And if you, if it's fallow for a week, that's okay. But, and cause if you're doing your next crop, but if it's fallow for a whole season, uh, like they used to do rotations and then leave a field fallow, that's no longer considered a good agricultural practice. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of in the similar vein, but going forward for a little bit more useful to a lot of our customers coming in, when you have a area, maybe you have a new garden or a new spot or something that is not been touched for maybe a year or two years by a previous tenant, or even just you or doing other stuff and you want to start gardening again. Um, is there a really good method? I think um, you're mentioning the sheet mulching and, and stuff like that, but is there another good method to um, work into your soil, maybe some more of the kinds of compost and things um, that would help promote your growth? Should you wait some time after you do that before you start planting? Can you plant right away? Kind of stuff like that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, so it's always been recommended to work in compost in the top six inches of soil. I mean, that's what every everybody recommends. Mm -hmm. And when you actually look at people that are looking at the, the organisms in the soil, they're, they're just saying, just put it on top, just top dressing, and you can plant right away. Um, the plants are going to grow better um, in the years to come when they improve the soil, but you're not going to, it's not really the same digging in compost as big globs into the soil as having a surface of top dressing and then the roots going down and integrating everything in a slow fashion. So it is kind of like slow garden movement, like the slow food movement. Um, whereas um, you can get a quick and dirty, um, you know, annual garden with, um, 
cultivated soil and stuff like that, but you'd have to do that every single year. But for a sustained approach to high soil organic material, high soil organic carbon, um, the organisms are going to be a lot happier undisturbed. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep on going on because I actually, these are really interesting and I would like to know more about it because also um, when you're planting a new plant uh, and you dig a hole for the plant, we often, I will recommend and many people recommend to not just dig a hole exactly the same size as your plant as you go in, you kind of disturb the soil around it and maybe mix in some of your soil amendment and then plant your plant around it and put it on and water it. So it has a nice transition from pot to, to mixed soil to ground soil. Is that a good kind of concept? Is there some other kind of variation around that you think? I think my son just came in and my dog is welcoming him. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the, um, you do have to do a transition because if you just sink in the, the pot without the plastic, it's going to think it's still in the pot and won't necessarily get the roots out into the surrounding soil. You don't want to dig deeper um, than uh, the crown. You don't want to dig a deep hole um, because that soil will settle and you're going to sink in the crown. So just have the depth so that the crown is just a little bit over the aggregate soil height. And you do want to have a wider um, hole than the than the original pot because you can loosen up and spread out the roots and um, have them start to go out instead of, you know, just going around in a circle as a pot bound without the pot kind of thing. So you can uh, definitely, you know, mix in. You don't necessarily have to mix in um, uh, compost into the soil. You can break up the soil and, and pat down the roots and then water it really, 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 really thoroughly because uh, you don't want the surrounding area to wick out all the water. And then watering it super thoroughly also fills in the little tiny nooks and crannies. So the uh, roots have a lot of soil contact. Um, but for native plants, you don't need to add amendments and you really want them to be living in the native soil as quickly as possible. Um, you can certainly um, put down a layer of compost and or a layer of mulch um, away from the crown of the plant. Um, but so the Charles Downding, um, chap, the British guy, he actually has side-by-side -side plots of dig versus no dig in intensive gardening and weighs his harvest and always gets higher harvest with the no dig plots. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and like, I'm getting too old to dig. So good, Charles. Yeah, no, it's definitely a very interesting concept that, that I haven't really heard too much about. And it's kind of making me think a little bit more about how to actually plant in the area and um, keep the soil I, I really liked your representation of using like the bread where you have like the mixed up flour, like the very like loose and you pour the water over it compared to like a more structured sponge kind of structure that the soil aggregates are making. Um, we actually had some people earlier and I think you went over it a little bit more, but um, the concept of soil aggregates, could you just touch on a little bit more about like the different sizing and maybe how you can promote the proper sizing if there's a possibility in that kind of way? Well, the sizing is going to depend on your the mineral content of your soil. So that crazy triangle with clay, silt, sand, and loam, if you look at... Um, Would you be able to go back to that one, actually? Oh, sure. Let me... Um, Escape full screen. Well, here's the three sizes. So um, if you are in an area that's naturally clay soil, you're going to make the micro aggregates because your mineral particles are going to be so tiny. And when you glue them together, um, they're going to end up tiny as well. And then if you are in sandy soil, um, then you're going to be getting the bigger um, particles. So the, the aggregate size is really going to be dependent, dependent on the native soil, on the mineral content of your native soil. And there's maps that show, I mean, in our seven acres, I've got three strains of soil. I've got Katati, fine sandy loam, Pajero, fine sandy loam, and Steinbeck, fine sandy loam, even though I'm not in Monterey. They're all Monterey names. But um, so there's classifications of the mineral content. But what you're promoting are the soil organisms that make the glue that glue them together. Because then when you have a stable soil aggregate, then you've got the structure that roots can go through, 
Again, air, I mean, it's counterintuitive, but plants breathe just like we breathe. When we metabolize, we bring in oxygen and breathe, breathe out carbon dioxide. Well, every single cell of a plant breathes also, takes in, not with lungs, but they, they absorb oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. They just happen to do more photosynthesis in balance. So in aggregate, they kick out more oxygen, thank you, than, uh, and take up carbon dioxide, thank you. But root cells need oxygen. And every plant that say grows in a Louisiana wetland that has standing water, those roots have to get oxygen down. So that's why the cypress trees have those funny little knees in their roots and tubes. So they bring oxygen down. So plant has to do something special if it's going to be totally aquatic or partially aquatic. But you need air, water, minerals, and glue to make a soil aggregate. And the glue comes from the organisms, either bacteria, brushing your teeth, or fungi, myco, um, the glomulin. Yeah, and then they, and the time to bring it together and actually- And the time, yeah, right. Yeah, work. and so you just leave so, it alone and let it do its thing. I know, it's kind of like baking bread, just walk away, just let it do its thing. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then actually, uh, you're talking a lot about the bacteria and the mycorrhizae, um, and I think you mentioned a little bit, but I had some questions about maybe worms and actually adding worms and promoting worms and also using worm castings. And could you talk a little bit on that? Right. So um, the soil food web, uh, where's all our little friends? Oh, here we go. There, there. yeah. Um, oh, so, so there's there's the big worms like the earthworms. And curiously in the United States, um, with the glaciation of the ice ages, they actually froze out the earthworms and there weren't any earthworms. Uh, and they were reintroduced from Europe by bringing accidentally bringing in soil and stuff like that. So they're repopulating. Um, and earthworms can, and other insects, oh, insects can be uh, shredders. So they can uh, ingest larger particles and make them smaller. And then the bacteria can eat the smaller particles. So um, adding earthworms to the soil, um, you basically, if the soil is happy, it's kind of like if you build it, they will come. So if um, the soil has just some moisture, some cover, um, and is getting listened up with stable soil aggregates, you're going to get more earthworms. So if you're digging into soil and finding earthworms, pat yourself on the back because you've got the whole compendium. You've got the bacteria for the earthworms to eat. and so they're big enough for you to see with your eyes, but the only reason they're there is they've got all the stuff to to eat and the environment um, to get through the soil and stuff like that. So they're an indicator of healthy soil for sure. And the nematodes, some of them are pathogenic. Some of them kill plants, but a lot of them are beneficial. And the fungi, um, you know, there are powdery mildew and stuff like that, but the soil fungi are super beneficial. And there's a great picture um, of a fungi actually eating a nematode. The fungi oh. wraps around it and then blows up its body like blowing up with those long balloons and strangles it. And then, um, you know, fungi don't have teeth or mouth. They um, they have external digestion. They, they leach out the chemicals to digest it and then absorb the nutrients. But it's like a doggy dog world down there. Wow, very but cool. But you can have a... a you can have a vermiculture compost pile, but I don't think you can add, you know, earthworms significantly to your garden, but they'll, they'll come if the soil gets happier and happier and happier. You can monitor that year by year by year by having cover crops, multi-species cover crops, um, and lots of different kinds of plants in your garden and not disturbing the soil. Yeah. And I know that um, when you have some worms, more worms grow pretty quickly. They actually proliferate pretty fast. Yes. Um, and yeah. then we, in our store, actually everything you mentioned here, we have nematodes, worms, and uh, definitely lots of different kinds of mycorrhizae in our fertilizers that you can right. add to your soils. Um, and as well as if you're doing like worm composting bins, which are also pretty fun to, to do to get some nice compost that you make at home. Um, we sell the, right. the bins and the worms for them too. Right. Um, sort of, a, yeah, a smaller scale than having sheep in your backyard. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which I, I live in San Francisco and not very many of us have sheep in our backyards. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I would like to have um, 
a little bit more talk actually, because I think it's a really interesting subject about using uh, organic versus synthetic fertilizers. I had someone asking um, if all the organic fertilizers we have or we sell are not synthetic, and that is the through the definition of them. They you if you get an organic fertilizer that's certified, then it is organic. Um, but you mentioned how uh, the synthetic fertilizers will make it harder for the plant to excrete the um, the exudate. term you use, the exudates. Yes. Uh, and I just want to know, like, maybe just touch on that one more time, because actually it's a really interesting subject yeah. that I didn't know about. So synthetic fertilizer was, is, is from um, basically crude oil. I mean, it's from uh, hydrocarbons, from the oil industry. And it was uh, invented by Haber. It's called the Haber-Bosch reaction. It takes a lot of heat and pressure to um, change atmospheric nitrogen into uh, ammonia or one of the, or nitrates, one of the other compounds that plants can use. So in terms of your carbon footprint, you're adding a lot to the carbon footprint by using synthetic furnish, fertilizer. Plus it runs off so quickly, it doesn't stay with your plant very long. I mean, if you have a house plant and you're watering it and it stays in a basin of the house plant, you're not you're not contaminating a stream because you've got a house plant, like the thousand house plants behind you. Um, so that that's a little different. But it turns out there's a soil scientist in Australia named Dr. Christine Jones, and she has a lots and lots of uh, webinars and, and talks online. And she basically talks to industry, the agricultural industry, ranching and farming in areas that in Australia that have eight inches of rain a year. I mean, talk about dry, eight inches of rain a year, and talks about the importance of soil organisms. And it's her observation that when you add a synthetic fertilizer, it's like um, giving a kid sugar candy and asking them to eat, you know, uh, whole wheat bread afterwards. It's like, ah, eh, no thanks. Um, so they get the quick and dirty, and they won't put out the soil, the root exudates to support the soil organisms, and it actually drops off the exudates, and so the organisms die because they don't get fed, and then you have to keep fertilizing because they don't have the organisms, the you know valets to go fetch water and minerals and stuff like that. So you actually get a quick response, but you you need to keep that up and um, you'll actually have a deficit in the future if you stop. Interesting. So it's also the the synthetic fertilizers aren't able to actually feed the those organisms in the soil. They really need the compounds that the plants are making and then feeding them through their right. systems. Right. So yeah, so the synthetic fertilizer basically will be nitrogen, available nitrogen, but the compound, the root exudates is a lot of sugar water. I mean, a lot of just plain old food calories um, that the bacteria and the fungi and the nematodes and all those um, little swimmy things, flagellates and amoebas and all those things um, are actually eating, just like if we have you know, a cross out in the morning. So, you know, our diet could be 60% carbohydrates and so is there. And, um, but they, the plants also in the root exudates have signaling capabilities to have the um, soil organisms fetch them minerals and um, get out the phosphate from the, from the hardening in the rock that the plant can't do. So they really work together and they get everything for the plant. So you really want them healthy and happy and fed. Very nice. Um, I have a little bit more I was going to go over, but as we get to the uh, end of the hour, as people start to drop off, I just want to thank everyone for being here and asking your questions. Um, and if you are interested on our website right now, there is the um, this week's outline. And if you click on that, you actually have access to this whole PowerPoint presentation and the resource list that you have at the very end, which is very helpful. So um, if you want all that information, it's on our website, uh, as well as this is going to be, this is recorded right now, and it'll be on our uh, YouTube page. So you can go back and watch it and get all the information again, um, and as well as all of our other webinars. Uh, I'm going to ask a few more questions before we go, but I just want to at least touch on that before everyone starts to peter out as so. Um, and the, um, one of the things I was asking about is um, the difference in our city, we have a lot of different kinds of soils, as you're mentioning, and as you said, in your backyard, you have a different kinds of soils that you can deal with. Um, a lot of ones I deal with are sandier soils near our coastal areas and clayer soils in our more hillier areas. Um, 
And do you have maybe some recommendations for different types of soil amendments or different types of approaches to those different kinds of soil types that uh, can help a new gardener or someone trying to deal with that? Well, the soil amendments, I mean, basically compost is plant material that's been sitting around long enough to have the organism start to decompose, like compost decompose. And when you have a compost pile, it has to have a moisture content of 40%. Mm. I mean, really high. When you take a handful of compost, you squeeze it, you don't get water dripping out of it, but it is wet. And that's why a brush pile or something like that in California is gonna take years to decompose because it's gonna have 10 months of no moisture. Um, and you also need it really, really finely ground up. It's just like, you setting out a bowl of fruit on the table, no one eats it, but you throw it in the blender and make it a smoothie, then everyone slurps it up. I mean, you have all the bacteria have just so much more um, surface area to eat at it. So compost is good for clay soil and sandy soil um, and gets the ball rolling until you have enough healthy plant compendiums um, to carry, carry on with it, supporting the soil organisms. So, I don't think you need to change your buying habits if you're coastal or clay. You can change your plant preference um, and you can look at say calscape.org or the slow um, information sheet on the plants. And you know, some plants tolerate clay soil, some plants only live in sandy soil, like the sand verbena, duh, it's in the name. Um, so you would taper your choices and just have your friend have a plant that you love um, in the clay soil. Um, but yeah, so it's compost wouldn't have any a sizable amount of mineral contents of the the mineral, the ground up rocks are the are your your yard. Yeah. That's where your house is and live with it. It's like acceptance. Like, you know, your partner, you know, only plays chess at two o'clock in the morning, like just live with it, you know. And and flourish with it because there's a whole bunch of lovely plants that like that ecosystem. Yeah, there's so many different options and varieties that you can try, and um, and a lot of times just some will do better than others, and just finding out what does good in your soil. Um, talking about actually the mineral contents and stuff of the soil, do you know a little bit more? Because it's actually a kind of um, vague topic for me as well. But using uh, azomites or also gypsum and those kinds of minerals to um, do change up your soil a little bit or anything like that or add nutrients? Right. I mean, I'll see like huge piles of white gypsum and, you know, adding to the soil and stuff like that. Um, and my soil is a little bit alkaline. So the plants that like lower pH, like blueberries, are not particularly happy. Um, and I, my personal thing is just to go with the plants that are happy with, with what I've got and not force blueberries to grow there. In, by adding, you know, um, sulfur dioxide or whatever it is you have to add to make it acidic. So I'm more like accommodating to to what nature gave me. But for specific plants, you can have a microcosm of something that's a little bit different um, for a special plant and um, change the pH. Um, generally, it's it's pH. If you have enough healthy, diverse organisms in the soil, they're going to fetch those minor minerals on the periodic table for right. the plant. And um, that seems to be very important because phosphate is mined and there's, you know, just like lithium mining for batteries or something like that. There's only that many known deposits. And so you don't want to run out. You don't want the agricultural system to fail because you've mined all the you know, phosphate or whatever. Um, so you want the healthy organisms to fetch stuff for your plants for you rather than you bringing them in on a truck or in a bag. Yeah. Well, it's really good. And I, I really like the insight onto more um, the sustainable gardening as well as uh, understanding your soil and kind of like working with what you have and and then just knowing all the different components that really go into it and um, kind of respecting them and also helping them along how you can, but not, you know, doing too much to disturb them, which. Uh, I know, I'm asking people our... to do less. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like, <laughs> wait a minute, you know, it's not that hard work, you know, you can't brag to your friends that you like double dig your vegetable garden. Like, yeah. And, and it's been tested. It isn't like hyperbole. It isn't just, you know, well, it would be rural legend rather than urban legend, right? Um, but no dig works. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you again. Um, 
and everyone who stuck around or and watched the video live i appreciate all of you being here and learning with us um and then anyone watching in the future on our website thank you and on the youtube page thank you very much um and check out all the other classes we have coming up um and we'll be seeing joan pont here i guess in a couple months or so for another talk on natives and all the fun stuff there so <laughs> i'm excited to see that one as well thank you yeah. All right. Everyone enjoy your rest of your Saturday. I hope you have a nice time gardening and learn a little bit from our class today and I'll be seeing you next time. Bye Ciao. everyone.